But as long as they don't touch mad as hell, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much and good evening. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I love it when our Prime Minister, doesn't matter who it is, although in this case it's Scott Morrison, goes overseas and is seen rubbing shoulders, or in these COVID times, elbows with actual world leaders that run proper countries. It makes Australia seem real somehow. You know, like when you dress up as Hellboy for a Comic-Con event and get to have your picture taken not only with the real Abe Sapien, but the Emperor Palpatine as well. So I think we all know exactly how the PM felt when he met Boris Johnson and Joe Biden over the weekend. Uh, this is the first time he's actually met Joe Biden in person, and I think you'll agree they did seem to get on much better over the phone. Now, the PM was uh, over there as an observer, which uh, means that he was uh, just supposed to sit over in the corner with India and South Africa and South Korea and not talk to the cool kids. But he wasn't going to stand for that lying down. He got up and he talked about how great our emissions figures are, if you include the artificial reductions from not clearing land for agriculture and ignoring our coal exports. Because if we don't do it, then some other rogue state might. And he spoke fondly of how Australia loves the US and how we have a special relationship with them. Uh, kind of like the one Lenny has with George and Of Mice and Men. And all this fawning and smiling gormlessly paid off handsomely with the PM getting to have dinner at Number 10 Downing Street with Boris Johnson and then meeting Her Majesty the Queen and hopefully regaling her with that great story about his ancestor from the mother country who, as he tells it... ...came out in the first fleet on the Scarborough. He stole some yarn in Cornwall and, uh, and the rest is history. And, as you can see, that yarn has stayed in the family ever since. But the G7 was the main game, and uh, given the global pandemic and an expansion as China, Mr Morrison hit the nail right on his finger when he said... There has never been a more important time for Australia to be sitting around the table. So it's a real shame that we weren't. Not that we weren't popular. I mean, twice as many people as we expected turned up for our bilateral chat with Joe Biden. It was really good. I mean, they only spoke for 40 minutes, uh, which left plenty of time for charades. There was an embarrassing moment, though, wasn't there? Man as hell fashion correspondent, Yana Ninebottles. That is right, Sean. It was right at the very beginning when Scott Morrison turned up in exactly the same outfit as Joe Biden, a faux pas he'd previously committed at the French G7 two years earlier with Boris Johnson. So, just as well, Scott checked ahead to avoid a third clangor with Angela Merkel. <laughs> very glad he left that little ensemble in the suitcase. Me too. Thanks very much, Yana. Of course, the PM was in the city of love. Uh, no, understandable mistake, I did mean Paris. Now, as I say, uh, this was today their time, and we record the show yesterday our time, so we don't know what happened when the PM met Emmanuel Macron, but we assumed it looked something like this, more or less. And while we have no idea what went on, we're, uh, we're guessing that apart from the PM probably giving the Macrons a box of fine Australian wine as a present, he didn't do anything too embarrassing. And, you know, it's a good chance for the PM being in France to see what democracy is all about. Let's face it, if the French don't like who's in charge, they let you know pretty damn quick. I mean, could you imagine doing that to Scott Morrison? And he flips his wig when someone dares ask him a question at a press conference. But you see, for the French, their democracy has been hard fought for. In Australia, it was just there when we woke up one morning. So I wonder if the PM will return to our shores with a renewed respect for the power of the people. Later on, I talk to the ghost of the Sun King, Louis XIV. Ben, Bichon, autrefois, bien sûr, si les gens se retournaient contre vous, ils attaqueraient la Bastille. French people are still pretty keen to take to the streets, though, aren't they? Ah, uh, oui, aujourd'hui, ils se mettraient pour n'importe quoi. Les croissants sont froids, ils renversent une voiture de police. Quand c'était moi, le roi d'ailleurs, les gens avaient de quoi se plaindre. But do you think Scott Morrison will come away from his visit understanding that there's more to an egalitarian society than just your right to attend a football match. And that freedom isn't just about not being shot when you're protesting outside Parliament during question time. Malheureusement, Sean, on apprend les leçons d'histoire qui soit trop tard. Pour vrai dire, quand vous donne un gifle, ce n'est rien. À mon époque, on vous prendra la tête entière. <laughs> Of course, Paris was just a trip to Hawaii compared to the raging bushfire of the G7, the chief concern of which was climate change and reducing emissions. As the PM outlined before he left the country in an aeroplane for a six-hour car trip... Challenges 
It's a good point. The big fear, of course, is a call for carbon tariffs, which we don't want. As the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Angus Taylor, explained. And so this is a very important point. Uh, if we're not careful, this will descend into a trade war, and that's why we're, we're dead against it. Mm. And I'm joined now by one of the flies seen crawling all over Mr Taylor's face in that clip. Uh, Fly, thanks for joining us. Greetings, Sean, and salutations. Fly, I understand that you actually crawled inside of one of Mr Taylor's nostrils. Yes, that's right, Sean. I got up his nose, literally and metaphorically. Was this some sort of protest? Yes, I chained myself to one of his nasal hairs to highlight this government's refusal to set an emissions target, Sean. Bit of a greenie, are you? I was when I came out of his nose, yes. You see, Sean, I am deeply concerned about what sort of planet I'm going to leave my pupae and my pupae's pupae. All right, well, uh, I wish you continued success and be careful out there. You got very close to his mouth at one point. Yes, although it's very difficult, Sean, to resist the lure of all the crap that he speaks. But hark! <laughs> John Barillaro is about to issue another statement dismissing concerns that the $50,000 grant to a cooperative linked to Angus Taylor's family may have been improper. I must away! Uh, what, watch out, I, I hear he hasn't got that much of a sense of humour. One of the reasons our PM isn't all that concerned about global emissions is that... The jungle is growing back. Which is also great news for the elephant in the room at the G7, namely the impotence of the World Trade Organisation, in that the elephant can now leave the room and return to the revitalised jungle. But first, some tough, awkward questions had to be asked, and uh, only the PM was prepared to ask them. How do you eat an elephant? And fortunately, he was prepared to answer them as well. One bite at a time. And... That's what dealing with reforming the WTO is a bit like. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not time to, to chow down. You, you need to. It's a beautiful metaphor. Eating an elephant, and uh, one we can all relate to. And also a timely warning to anyone tempted to eat their elephants whole. That's whole with a W. The thing is, when it comes to getting emissions from the resources sector down, the PM is serious when he says that he's going to do it using what he calls the Frank Sinatra approach. Meaning, I guess, that like Frank Sinatra, he'll get into violent arguments with Australian journalists he thinks have wronged him. Labor, of course, typically have attacked the PM's pledge, saying the PM's comments were a desperate attempt to cover his own government's gold standard incompetence. Well, at least his incompetence is gold standard, because the LNP actually supports the mining and resources industry. The trouble with Labor's incompetence is that it doesn't work when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. But is Australia's refusal to commit to a net zero emissions target at the G7 just going to make us look like an increasingly rising backwater? Or is it something more serious for the LNP? Labor desperately hopes so. This is a circumstance whereby Scott Morrison is increasingly isolated. Mm. Albo ensuring he's not isolated by physically holding on to another human being. And there is something, I think, of an allegory in that clip too for Labor's own divisions over gas and coal, with their leader attempting to placate those disquieted by alternately moving to the left and to the right. To the left and to the right again. Still, I'm uh, not here to bag the Labor Party. Quite the opposite, in fact. There is a little-known codicil in the ABC Charter which gives us unlimited power to prop up the Australian Labor Party during times of peak irrelevancy. And champion... Never mind that! Oh, yes, a question from up the back there. You know how the world's being run by a cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles? Well, what I want to know is why don't they do something about all those different bins I have to put out nowadays? Well, I don't know if the world is run by the cabal you describe. Well, that was my takeaway from Monday night's Four Corners. Well, you shouldn't believe everything you misinterpret on television. You should do your own research about these things on the dark web. I haven't got time to do that. I've got to pull all my bins out. Plus, I only use the internet to watch Four Corners on iView because the television talks to me and tells me to do things. Well, is he right? Does the television talk to you and tell you to do things? Send your answers to Do You Do Things Because The TV Tells You To, Care Of, The ABC, etc, etc. And you could win a Fran Kelly jelly flan. Why not double your delight in the mornings by tucking into a baked custard dessert moulded into the very face of the very RN breakfast presenter you're listening to? Mmm, that's just kind of weird. Well, coming up, Tosh Greenslade in a wig and glasses does basically a promo for that Australia Talks thing. That's exactly right, Sean. We asked tens of thousands of Australians, are you a current federal Liberal MP? 0.1% said yes. Of that 0.1%, we asked, do you have any strong moral or ethical objections to any of the government's current policies? 53% said yes. Of those who replied yes, we then asked, have you expressed your concerns to your party's leadership? 85% said, fuck off, and I can't be seen talking to you. While the remaining 15% said they were late for a prayer meeting. Sean. 
Thank you, Tosh. Tosh Greenslade there in a wig and glasses making a satirical observation about the divide between the centre-right and hard-right in the Liberal Party room, with a sting in the tail in the end there about being in the PM's good books if you share the same religious belief. Thanks, Tosh. Now, COVID, of course, was something everyone at the G7 was very concerned about. Catching it, I expect, being in England. And uh, like you, my heart swelled with fluid when I heard the PM promised 20 million doses to Pacific nations as part of the global plan to deal with the pandemic. And if that rollout goes anything like ours, most of the Pacific nations will be underwater by the time we turn up to deny we ever promised them anything in the first place. Speaking of our rollout, uh, one question that came up during Victoria's recent outbreak was why the government withdrew support for single-site workforce arrangements and allowed workers to go back to work across multiple facilities, but then later brought it back as soon as there was a hotspot triggered by health authorities. Now, this is Greg Hunt's responsibility, but he didn't come up with this scheme himself. Uh, that was you, wasn't it? Level naught public servant seconded to the health department when Trish has an RDO, Marinara Trench. Yes, Sean, that was one of mine. The policy is based on a similar one I developed in my former life, running an archery range. Uh, to cut costs on office space, we put our desks out in the empty space between the archers and the targets. Well, that sounds dangerous. Well, no, Sean, you see, from most of the time there was no arrows being shot at the targets, so it was perfectly safe. Though not in the strict meaning of perfectly. Well, if during the course of the day I began to notice arrows flying by and or into people, I would declare the area an arrow hotspot and we would immediately drag our desks away and then drag them back again when things had calmed down. As a precaution, did you at least consider getting uh, medieval helmets for your staff? We did, yes. But helmets didn't actually prevent arrows from ricocheting off the heads of staff and back at our customers. So you got helmets for the customers as well? Well, due to supply chain difficulties, we could only manage to get some customers half a helmet. But we found that if and when the customers could hear an arrow approaching, they quickly put it on. That would usually be enough to limit hospitalisations to an acceptable level. Yeah, the point of preventative measures, though, is to have them in place at all times, just in case. It's not something you activate once the damage has been done. I'm surprised no one died at your facility. Well, we had a spot of luck. An aged care worker with COVID visited and we had to shut the whole place down. Yeah. And uh, while we're on the subject of wholesale COVID bungling, I've reviewed the footage of Aged Care Services Minister Richard Colbeck in Senate Estimates a few weeks back, and I think I understand how this whole aged care farrago still hasn't been sorted out. How many of the 21 hotel quarantine breaches could have been avoided if your government had simply acted on the recommendation delivered by Ms Holton eight months ago? Minister? Sorry, could you repeat oh the question for me, please? He was miles away, as he should be until all aged care residents are vaccinated. Coming up, that I imagine shortly after eating it, and... A fire at a massage parlour has forced clients and workers to smash windows to get out. It's believed friction from excessive rubbing is to blame. Now, with the uh, PM overseas, it means no one is in charge. Acting PM Michael McCormick doesn't count or read. In fact, from what I understand, he can barely tie his shoelaces. And this has left open the very real possibility of a power grab, which uh, we're going to look at tonight in a little segment we like to call... <laughs> OK, well, first up, last week's Foreign Affairs Minister, Maurice Payne, was positioning herself to win over the hearts and minds of those still with them in this country by getting on the front foot about the Bilawila Tamil family when she suggested the possibility of relocation. I understand that there are two options being looked at. Uh, the United States is the first of those, uh, and New Zealand is, uh, is also an option. Yeah, now, that's not quite what most people wanted, but at least they wouldn't have been imprisoned Papillon-style on an island. And those who are ideologically opposed to mercy, uh, they would have been happy too, because the family wouldn't get to live here in Australia. It's great. Everybody wins, sort of. Of course, the Tamil family was still technically here in Australia, and that's the opposite of foreign affairs. So Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews thought she'd uh, take the talking stick away from Maurice and try beating us over the head with it instead. I actually haven't said that I'm investigating resettlement options for that uh, oh. family. What I did say is that I was looking at investigating resettlement options oh. in a range of circumstances. Well, yeah, a range of circumstances which doesn't include the family. Still, at least she was trying to help everybody else that wasn't them. Then, uh, then a whole bunch of backbenchers got in on the act. And finally, Alex Hawke, of all people. <laughs> Fancy the Immigration Minister getting involved in all of this. 
Anyway, the big mouse, though, making a play while the Prime Ministerial cat was visiting the Queen was, of course, Defence Minister Peter Dutton, seen here making sure you notice him by wearing a high-vis vest while insisting everybody else, including the tank, wears camouflage. He grabbed our attention by saying, and I am paraphrasing here, uh, screw Europe, we want to get into bed with the US so that when we hear a noise downstairs that might be China breaking in, we can make the US get up and go downstairs armed with a golf club while we lock ourselves in the bathroom. Now, I know a golf club doesn't sound like much to defend yourself with, but it's better than nothing, which is what we've got at the moment when you look at our submarine capacity. Although, to be fair to Peter Dutton, his announcement last week to extend the life of the old Collins-class submarine beyond their 2026 lifespan until the new ones are ready will have a nostalgic appeal to the hundreds of people around this country who enjoy watching Restoration Australia. Peter Dutton is uh, live in Canberra, though it is hard to tell by looking at him. Dr Eldon Tyrell from the film Blade Runner. You don't believe Peter Dutton's plan to extend the life of these submarines is a practical one, do you? Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of my jurisdiction. Doesn't seem to stop Dutton talking about stuff outside his portfolio when he turns up on the Today Show. Sean, all of this is academic. They were made as well as we could make them. And that's more than can be said for the non-existent French ones. What about an EMS-3 recombination? We've already tried it. Ethyl methane sulfonate is an alkylating agent and potent mutagen. It created a virus so lethal the subject was dead before it even left dry dock. The government in pursuit of their defence strategy has done questionable things. Also extraordinary things. Revel in their time. The light that burns half as bright burns twice as long, Sean. And the Collins class has burned so very, very longly. And I think we have a footage of a Collins class submarine burning very, very longly. Uh... <laughs> Anyway, that, that's, that's the joke, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, for coming along tonight, please accept this gift pack of Matthias Corman's new celebrity skincare range. That's right, Sean. If you have trouble disguising your natural oiliness, About Face can help by removing dull and tired-looking policies, toning down any unwanted blemishes on your climate record and minimising the appearance of old party lines. Using all natural ingredients and packaging that leaves a zero carbon footprint, because that's a good thing now, you'll be almost unrecognisable as you unveil your new face to the world. Matthias Corman's About Face. Hmm, who is that? The easiest way to find out how Australians are feeling right now, other than to access their medical records, is to ask them. Well, the trouble with the glass confessional is that it gets very fogged up in there when you take your clothes off. We asked 60,000 Australians more than 600 questions. Mrs Garibaldi heard a sound in the early hours of the morning, sort of like a gravity ray pulling a building up into the sky. And then on sold the results to a data harvesting company to augment the personal information we've already supplied them from your ABC account login. For example, did you know one in three Australians don't know their neighbours by name? But I value my privacy. Not after we tell everyone. The push polling ranges from the big issues like how much do you trust the ABC to the small, like what superpower would you most like to have? China. Go to the Australia Talks website, answer all our questions or else, and find out how you blend in to the rest of the homogenous beige blancmange that is Australia. The me! Log into abc.net.au slash Australia Talks slash spyware and don't forget to leave your webcam on. Mm. Well, drugs, firearms, designer watches, luxury vehicles and millions of dollars in cash. No, they're not the bonuses paid to NBN staff. They're the result of a three-year-long global covert operation involving the Australian Federal Police, which shattered local and international crime networks in a coordinated sting... ..targeting organised criminals who were tricked into using encrypted phones, which police could decode and read in real time. Thanks, Ricardo. I was running out of breath there. The operation was named Ironside, after the famous paralysed 1970s TV detective character. The connection rather tastelessly being that... The raids have crippled the Victorian chapter of the Comancheros bikey gang. The success of the sting is also great PR for our police forces, who have at times themselves been accused of corruption, with even AFP Commissioner Rhys Kershaw confirming... We have been in the back pockets of organised crime. Mm. 
The crime figures communicated openly about the nefarious activities via the encrypted app, and it seems clear that one of the more disturbing messages disseminated was to wear tracksuit pants at all times. While affording a level of comfort and freedom of movement favoured by the underworld, this dreadful blunder simply made the police's job of identifying them that much easier. Disappointingly for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the plan was concocted with the assistance of alcohol. As you know, some of the best ideas come over a couple of beers. Absolutely. And haven't we seen some light bulb moments at the Melbourne Cup over the years? Sadly, though, the sting failed to catch Australia's most wanted organised crime boss. Hakan Ayik, who's hiding in Turkey. Like some human to Duncan. And given that it was he who introduced the encryption app to the criminal networks, when he gets back here, he's going to be about as popular as Anthony Albanese. Still, as the police commissioner said... Look, I think given the threat probably he faces, he's best off handing himself in to us as soon as he can. Yeah, because at least in jail he'll be safe. But the big question in all of this is, what's the deal with this picture here? A lot of you are probably thinking, well, how embarrassing they both turned up at the press conference in exactly the same podiums. But no, no, I was wondering why the PM was there at all. AFP Detective Superintendent Max Payne, firstly, congratulations on the operation. Thank you. It's much easier to sit down now. And secondly, the sting. Managed with ointment. And what about last week? Yeah, a massive pain in the ass. No, no, I'm talking about the press conference with the Prime Minister. So am I. Still, I suppose the PM is well within his rights to call the AFP and the FBI to a press conference and then to make them stand behind him while he personally takes credit for a three-year investigation. Absolutely, Sean. Although I should point out the PM didn't actually do any investigating himself. Though I'm sure he'd be more than ready to roll out the skills they've been honing in there at the PMO on all those internal investigations they keep having into themselves. Well, you can tell this isn't their work, though, because it resulted in consequences. But we don't mind Hellboy hogging the limelight, Sean. After all, you don't get into policing for the applause. You get into it for the uniform and to be able to park anywhere you want. But isn't there a problem with what the PM is doing in terms of the separation of powers? I mean, yes, the police are a branch of the government, but crucially, the police don't make the legislation, and that ensures the formulation of the law and its application remain independent of each other. Oh, yes, but while the police can't make the law, there's nothing to say the government can't start doing police work. It's a, a rather clever loophole. So the government are doing police work? Normally, taking credit for our work is part of our work, yes. Is there a chance that this was just a distraction to make the government look tough on crime and not tough on that Tamil family from Biloela? Sean, the two couldn't be less connected if they were making a Zoom call over the NBN. In one case, the government is backing the law as it stands and operating at arm's length. In the other, the government is standing with their back to the law and are in it up to their elbows. And if I can be frank for a moment... Anyone who thinks this government is some genius Machiavellian puppet master controlling the media cycle and capable of pulling strings at all levels and manipulating our perception of reality hasn't seen them try to roll out vaccines in disability care. Max Payne, thank you. And uh, on that note, perhaps instead of uh, charging these people who managed to smuggle 3.7 tonnes of drugs into the country, they should be subcontracting them to import the rest of our Pfizer vaccine. I'll get on to it. Thank you very much. Max Payne there. And just on this topic... Uh, excuse me, Sean. Uh, yes, uh, yes, madam. Yeah, I have a misbehaving four-year-old and I've tried to follow the government's lead, you know, imprisonment, isolation, refusing her cries for help, but absolutely nothing is working. So I was wondering if you had the number of that French au pair Peter Dutton got out of immigration detention a couple of years ago after she'd overstayed her visa. Do, do you know if she's still available and what her rate is? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Alternatively, Alex Hawke's contact details. I understand he's very useful if you need help at the last minute. I'm, I'm sure it is, but no, I don't know his details. Uh, but if you think you do, etc., etc., and you could be in the running to win a Q&A reminder electrocution kit, be sure not to miss your favourite news panel show in its new time slot by receiving a short shock to your nipples every five minutes on the day of broadcast. Q&A. Mmm, that's really more a comment. And can I just say on this whole Biloela Tamil family situation that I agree with what our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, originally said on the matter. This is a matter that is going through the, the, the court's process that has, they've initiated. Exactly, they initiated it. They lit the fuse and three years later it was still burning. Had our Immigration Minister not stepped in to stamp it out then it would have blown up in all our faces. Still, perhaps it's our fault. Our fault for being too kind, for giving these people the right to appeal in the first place. We leave it out there where anyone can pick it up and use it to test the validity of a legal finding. And, and they take advantage of it by actually using it. It's George Pell all over again. If only he hadn't been given the right to appeal, he'd still be in jail today. 
Actually, no, that's not a good example. He was only in detention for a year, not three. Anyway, the PM's point is well made. Justice is not only blindfolded, she's bound and gagged and locked in the boot of a car. And if people are stupid enough to seek it, then the very least we can do while it's taking too long is not grant them bail. Thursday night, Emily has a date with a very special guest. So, tell me, what was it like growing up in Melbourne? I grew up out in the north. I had a, a brother and a sister. Uh -huh. Yeah, um... OK. Are you ready? <laughs> OK. I think we'll do this one. <gasps> oh, wow! That's me! Yeah, so I used a high-saturation chrome filter just to highlight your fierce self-determination and cat's ears to show your kindness and vulnerability. Mate, that is honestly fantastic. We you email that to me? Mm hmm Oh, thank you. Emily's iPhone Amma camera, Friday, 7.30. Followed by Skeletal Remains in Staunton. Welcome back. Well, the tale of Craig Kelly's end is a story for the ages. Certainly took long enough to get to it. Time and time again, just when you thought he'd said or done something to destroy his career forever, he would be given another chance to go on and say or do something even more irredeemably stupid. Tonight, as part of our Matters Help initiative, the Australian Ballet, in conjunction with Opera Australia, present... Hughes electorate, we have a problem. Over to you, Maggie and Brian. Yeah, thanks, Sean. And if you've just joined us, Wanda and Frisbee, representing the siren songs of ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, are in the process of luring the never popular member for Hughes onto the cruel shoals of political reality. Yeah, quite right, Mags. In perpetual torment, because he's been repeatedly told by the Prime Minister to pull his head in, he cannot resist the urge to keep posting crap on Facebook. So defenceless is he against his almost Pete Evans-like compulsion that he advises the PM he's resigning from the Liberal Party. And, Mags, in the ultimate of tragedies, even Facebook decide to abandon him. Their deplatforming of the now independent MP becoming the very news that Facebook have to pay for if idiots like Craig are posting it. His career in tatters, our hero decides to retire from public life and record a podcast from his car. Now, which he does with the invaluable assistance of his loyal aide to comp, Frank Zumbo. Sean? Mm, I hope the lawyers weren't watching. Well, not coming up because you can't ask that is on in a minute. Question marks over more Sydney apartment towers. Pacific travel bubbles set to disappoint. And solar eclipse not as reliable as coal-fired ones, insists Angus Taylor. And finally, as Melbourne slowly emerges from its latest lockdown, their vaccine... Rollout has hit another major hurdle with the convention centre set to shut as a mass vaccination hub at the end of the month, and that's to make way for other exhibitions, such as Sexpo. And I'm glad to hear it. At last, some perspective. Yes, there's a global pandemic, but it's important to keep up to date with the latest in stainless steel butt plugs, G-spot vibrators and nipple clamps. Take in a fetish demonstration or visit the Carnal Carnival. And take a ride on the Shafter. I'll see you there.